Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Peter Robinson and today we've got Adrian and Paul. Is it Adrian? Is it both of you? Or is it just going to be Adrian? What, what are we doing? I, I don't think I let Paul have a word in. Um, <laughs> he's, he's done a lot of work in the background, but I don't think we'll give him any credit today. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to have Adrian give us a talk um, on... And I'm thinking beam sync, but that's wrong, isn't it? It's 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 a new the sync protocol for the beacon chain. And so look, why don't you tell us all about it, Adrian? And also please introduce yourself as well. Yeah. Um, so I'll be talking about checkpoint sync today. What I might do, um, because I designed this to have some introduction in my slides, so I'll do that with that up um, and go through that fun. I don't have a green box on my screen. Are you looking at slides? Yes, yes we are. good. It's always nervous when it stops showing me that. Um, so we we're talking about checkpoint sync, which, as Peter mentioned, is um, a way of syncing the beacon chain, the consensus layer of Ethereum, uh, which is incredibly fast. But as we'll see as well, it's more than just faster. It's actually the, the more secure way to sync. Um, so there's kind of a big change in mentality as we move to proof of stake in, in the way that that syncing is, is best done. So a little bit about me, um, I'm Adrian Sutton and I've been working with Consensus as one of the protocol developers uh, for the past four years or so, initially on Hyperledger Basu. So I've seen the execution layer and built a client there and been doing a lot of work on Teku for the past few years, getting it ready for the beacon chain launch and then going through to the merge. Um, that's probably all that's relevant about me here, um, but I'm based in Brisbane, Australia, um, and yeah, a background uh, beyond my time in Ethereum uh, in uh, traditional finance building exchanges. So the talk is titled Checkpoint Sync. I'm actually going to cover Checkpoint Sync in two slides uh, quite quickly, and the first one isn't actually about Checkpoint Sync. First, to understand checkpoint sync, we want to look at how sync from Genesis works. Now, this is probably the more classic blockchain syncing process that you imagine, where you start from this known Genesis state and you apply each block one by one. And what's useful to, to note is that unlike with uh, the ETH1 or the proof of work chain, the execution layer in Ethereum, the beacon chains state, its beacon state is actually very small. So it, it has similarities in that it's, it's not communicated in the process. We only send blocks around and then we regenerate the state locally as needed. Um, but even the latest state is 40 to 50 megabytes. And that's the entire state, everything you need. If you have that state and a block, you can get the next state. Whereas on the execution layer, the world state is more like 500 megabytes. Um, uh, at least, uh, I think I'm well understating that actually. It's, it's really big um, and even that's just the useful data. So you kind of have a, a, a whole world of stuff that you need to apply the next block. Um, for Beacon Chain, it's actually really simple and really small, this state. And that allows us that each time we're applying one of these blocks, we're generating that state and we have it in full that we store to disk by itself and then move on to the next one. So with checkpoint sync, um, the only difference is that instead of starting at Genesis, we actually start from a relatively arbitrary state somewhere along the, the blockchain. It needs to be one of the finalized portions of the chain. And uh, then we can keep applying blocks in the same way. Um, so that, that portion of the chain from before this block doesn't matter. We don't worry about it. We've just agreed we're starting here and we we can keep following the chain, which is why things can, can get in sync really quickly because we only need to process, you know, in a normal case, something like 100 blocks um, if you start from the latest finalized state. So let's have a look at this. Here's a video I prepared earlier because it's always really nervous waiting for peers to be found. It takes a little bit of time. Um, so all we're going to do is run Teku, telling it to load the in, in initial state from Infura. So that's actually another tech you node that Infura runs, uh, but all the, the standard clients support this uh, REST API. 
where you can request a state uh, and it'll give you back you know, that 50 meg of, of SSZ. And what we'll see is that Teku loads that up, it goes and downloads the state. And immediately we're seeing this head slot here of you know, 352, oh, what is that? 3 million. 525,000. So we're already a very long way along the chain. Um, and at the moment, we've got no peers. We're waiting for them to connect. So it's saying syncing. It's not actually doing anything uh, now other than finding peers. Once we get those, uh, you can see there's like 83 slots to, to catch up on to get to the beacon chain head, um, which we know because that's based on time in, in the beacon chain. Each slot is 12 seconds and they just kind of keep going. So some of those might be empty slots that we, we didn't get a block for, um, but it'll be around about that number of blocks. Now that we found some peers, uh, that starts moving and we see syncing has started, that head slot will start to move up on the next update that we see. And we're, we're pretty much done at this point. We'll be very close. So 23 slots remaining. There we go, we're now in sync. At that point, all the validators, if I was running some on this node, would be able to start a testing, they can start producing blocks, they're, they're working, the chain is ready to go. Um, and now we're starting to see the slot event, which is Tepi saying, I'm in sync and I've reached the next slot and I had the block there and that's its root and so on. So that's a fully synced node in under two minutes. Um, it's what, a minute and a half long video, I think. Um, that, yeah, that's, that's a pretty big game changer when you think of how many hours it takes to sync. Uh, an execution layer node. Um, and it's one of the really nice things about having such a small state is that we can get started soon. So if I cannot replay that, there we go. Right, so the difficult part is we've hand waved over a bit. We, we saw we got um, the state initially there from Infura. Where else can we get it from? Well, from any other node we run. So. You can do it with curl and store it to a file and put that on a USB disk, yeah, a USB, yep. Yeah. Um, so you can get it from a friend who's running a node. You can get it from one of your other nodes. Uh, for the Genesis state, uh, all the clients build it in, right? So uh, that's the same with, with the execution layer and with the consensus layer that you, you have the Genesis state already baked into your client and that's how it knows where to start from when syncing. But because we want a more up-to-date one, we really are preferring these other two methods in terms of getting a, a recent finalized state and, and jumping forward. The problem is that we're going to get to a question of trust. That first state we, we take is a really important one because we can't sync to any chain that that, that state wasn't a part of. Um, it's, it's essentially finalized and we're locked onto that chain. We will ignore all other peers on other chains. There's good and bad in that. If we get the right state, happy days, we're guaranteed to be on the right chain. If we get the wrong state, we're guaranteed to be on the wrong chain. So when we're talking about the Genesis state, it's baked into clients and our trust is put into the client developers. And we trust them because they're experts. Um, and also, because we're already trusting the code that they've written, that the client itself is implementing the rules of the chain properly and doing the state transition correctly. So there's already a large element of trust there. Getting the Genesis state from them, we feel pretty confident about that. Or we can go to some guy on the internet and he can give us a nice up-to-date state and we'll sync quickly, but yeah, it might kill us. Uh, how much do we trust where we're getting that source from? How did we verify? Or how do we know that we can trust whatever that URL that we put in happened to give us is the right chain? Because remember, we, that, that's our starting point. We will ignore everything else. Doesn't seem like a great choice. And all of a sudden you're thinking, well, you know, much more secure to sync from Genesis, right? Yeah, it seems that way. Then, then we come from an own state and we're verifying things along the way. The problem is with proof of stake, we have weak subjectivity. So you can't actually trust the Genesis state. Um, yes, it's a canonical, a part of the canonical chain. We can trust that it was the right state. But because so much time has gone forward from, from there, uh, we can no longer be 100% certain that the chain we follow is the correct one. Let's, let's talk that through a bit because it seems really scary and it's, it's not as 
it's not as scary as it first seems, right? So this is one view of a chain and each of these boxes is a validator. They're all active at Genesis, right? So we've got a relatively small number of validators here for an example, but they're all in, they're all validating. We're all attesting. All of them have got 32 ethered state. They misbehave, we know we can slash them. And that's the basis of our security. Later on in the chain, so some time has progressed, then one of those validators has exited and uh, withdrawn their funds. Now, okay, we haven't actually implemented withdrawals on the beacon chain yet. So this is a little bit hypothetical, um, but certainly they're coming. We promised we'd give people their, their stake back at some point, we'll have to. Uh, and even in protocol, once you've exited for long enough and you get to that withdrawable state, you're not able to be slashed in protocol. So even today, there is this possibility that I can exit and I no longer have the risk of being slashed. Later still, a whole bunch of validators have exited. And in fact, from our Genesis set, now two thirds of them have exited. That's enough to finalize a chain. Um, so if we only knew about these validators from the Genesis state, by the time we get to here, um, the, the set of validators in there aren't enough to, to give us the confidence. These ones, these ones we can't trust because they've got nothing at stake anymore. If we look at that a different way, um, it'll help us to, to understand. So this is uh, the same blockchain, different view. So each of these little, um, each tick is one of our active validators. Um, and the chain is progressing along normally and all the validators are active. As we keep going, eventually a couple of them exit and take their money out then some more withdrawal. Now, if we've been following that chain as it appeared, then we will get to here and we will say, this is our finalized chain because we've seen the attestations along, even though these ones have exited, we're not expecting attestations from them and maybe some new ones joined or whatever, but of our active validators, 100% are attesting correctly and we're able to keep finalizing this chain. It'll keep going. But the risk we have and the reason we can no longer trust this Genesis state is that after all these blocks have been created and we've gone through and they've taken their money back out, then those exited validators can actually go back in time um, and create really old blocks based off of a fork point where they've got nothing at stake, but they're still seen as active. So it's kind of hard to visualize, but uh, these are our exited validators on, on the bottom here that because there's two thirds of them, that's also a finalizing chain. Um, and, and on that version, like if you were following that version, you'd see them as active. So we will reject that chain uh, if we followed along this top path, because this is our finalized block. And this chain doesn't descend from our finalized checkpoint, uh, finalized state. So that's, that's the security and the benefit of a finalized chain we get in proof of state. But if you're following along, you know you can ignore these false chains that might come from exited validators because you've finalized, because you've locked in, that's the point at which every chain must descend. We can't change that history anymore. However, the problem comes along of, if I am syncing the chain later, after all this has happened, I might see the bottom chain first. And in that case, I don't know that they've exited and I will see this bottom chain as, a, as the one valid chain, and I will see this as my finalized block. Then when the real chain appears, this top chain, I finalize the bottom block. So this top chain is now invalid to me and I will lock onto the bottom chain. And that's the crux of the weak subjectivity point is, it's, it, it's, um, it's not that you can't be confident in the chain, it's that you can only be confident in the chain if you've been following it as it happens or within a reasonable time period. Um, and that time period, um, I think we'll talk about a bit later, but it's how long the validators have to exit and withdraw and kind of turn over that validator set. So that this is it. The weak subjectivity period is that period of time. So how long can you be offline for and still reliably sync from where you were, the last state you had up to the chain head? That period varies depending on the number of validators. It's in the order of weeks. Um, I think it's probably up pretty close to its maximum now because of the number of validators on mainnet and it's kind of a month or two months. 
Um, when you're when you're syncing a new node, though, you're obviously you know if you're starting from Genesis, then you're, you're starting from a year ago, and you're well outside that week's subjectivity period, which is where you start to get these risks of being unable to differentiate two valid looking chains because you don't have the, the latest finalized information. There is a proof of concept of this that the Nimbus team created. Uh, so they took the Piermont test network, uh, which we shut down and had a lot of validators exit from. They took all of their validators after they exited and actually created a long range fork, which is completely valid if you're following that from Genesis, it, it will pass in a normal client and you'll see it as a perfectly valid state transition. And they've just waited until uh, all the other validators leak out and their chain starts finalizing. Um, and now it's it's continuing on and it's kind of an alternate to the, to the Piemont testnet now. It's continuing to live perfectly valid network, just not actually the Piemont one, not the one we reach consensus on at the time and would consider canonical. So it can be done, we've seen it done. So now we're kind of in a bit of a difficult position because this random state we get from the internet might kill us, but also we know that the Genesis state isn't going to be enough to, to make sure we don't pick up you know, a murderous hitchhiker. Um, how do we sync this chain safely? What, what can we do? Well, it comes down to trusting that source but actually taking some time to verify that initial state. How do we do that? Well, uh, when, we're, when we're using a, a checkpoint sync, we can take that state route and go to multiple different sources like block explorers, like Impura, uh, ask our friend, check on Twitter. You know, at this block number, what was the state route you had? And if they match, we know our state is, is valid and on the canonical chain, it's safe to use. Uh, whether we're syncing from Genesis or Checkpoint Sync, and you know whether you're using the Beacon Chain or, or the existing proof of work chain, really good idea is when your node says that you've finished syncing, check. So check the head block route that it's re reporting against again multiple sources like Block Explorers. Did you actually sync to the right chain, or did your node get confused and follow off wrong chain, or was it figured wrong? You know, are you where you expect to be? That's good common sense, and it always has been um, through all of Ethereum's history and through every blockchain I'd used. That's a really good practice. If for some reason you do need to sync from Genesis, there is an option, and it's one of the first attempts to, to address this weak subjectivity problem that we came up with. You can actually specify, uh, all clients support this, a WS checkpoint option where you pass a block root and the epoch number that block root is for. And what happens is your, your client will just do its best to sync from Genesis. And when it gets to that epoch, it will check that the block root matches. And if it doesn't, your client will crash and tell you, hey, you've synced the wrong chain, which is good, at least you know, but it's detecting the problem, but not avoiding it. Because all you can do now is delete your database and sync from Genesis again, and hope that you actually wind up on the right chain this time. And if you got it wrong the first time, there's a very good chance you're going to get it wrong the next time, or you know, you've wasted weeks as well during the sync process before you found out. It's not a great solution. Um, and then it also suffers from a problem which we've had for checkpoint sync, and it's, it's slightly worse even with this WS checkpoint. Where do you get the checkpoint from? How do you find this block root and epoch number? Um, in theory, you, you can get it from block explorers, but it's somewhat hard to make sure you get the right block root matched to an epoch number. There was an endpoint on one block explorer for a time where they would actually literally tell you this in the right format, which was great. Nobody used it, so they removed it again. So there really isn't a good place right now to get that WS checkpoint. I'd recommend just completely ignoring that approach. It's, it's kind of a lost cause of, of trying to trace that down because it's, again, the main thing is it's detecting the problem but not avoiding it. We can do better with checkpoint sync and avoid the problem entirely. So what are the problems that we still have? Well, same thing with WS checkpoint as that we have with states. It's kind of hard to get them. Thankfully, Infura does provide them. Um, they're providing public access to those checkpoint states. So that makes it available and it's free. You've got to sign up for an Infura account. 
but it's a single point of failure and it's, it's a single point of trust, which isn't really what we like on, on you know, Ethereum chains. We really want to see more providers actually make the whole state available. Um, and it's not that hard for them to do because it is just one file. It's quite static. It works really well with HTTP cache headers. You can just say, you know, I'll grab the finalized checkpoint and maybe only update it once a day. You can set the cache length to be really long and put a, a CDN in front of it. Save you a lot of bandwidth, save you a lot of trouble. Really kind of, kind of an easy type of thing to distribute um, and really well suited for that is just one file. Uh, the second problem is that verification we've talked about, that trust, it's a manual process. And so most people skip it. And that's not great either, but we haven't worked out the usability of how to um, automate that verification without um, undermining the, the security of having a, a trusted starting point. Because if we look to the peers we have to, we find and we ask them, hey, is this the right state? Then we're trusting the network. And the whole point was that we can't trust the network. We don't know that they're, they're um, honest peers. Uh, or we don't know who they are um, and whether they're going to be leading us onto the wrong chain or not. We could put you know, a bunch of different providers like Infura and different block explorers as sources that clients could automatically um, check in with and check for you that we consider trusted. But then client developers are basically picking where the point of trust is for you. And if we, if we provide an option that you provide that list, well, then most people don't do it because it's basically manual verification. Again, you've got to find those, those URL endpoints and deal with them and, and update them and so on. So most people just won't. Um, the, the flip side of that is that when you look at the actual security model and you think it through, it's not as bad as it first seems, right? So even if you don't verify the state, there's a very, very high likelihood that you'll wind up in the right place as long as you're going to a, a you know, not completely someone random, something like Infura or a, a provider that's got a bit of trust behind them. The reason for that is that big providers can easily get the checkpoint state, the, their initial state, from one of their other nodes. So exchanges, Infura themselves, staking providers, and so on, they're not going to be using Infura. To, to get their state. They're not going to have that point of trust. They'll do it trustedly, trustlessly within themselves. And that means that if I go and find a way to hack into Infura so I could change these states, I'm actually not going to get any high value targets out of that. Um, and, and even for you know, the home user who happens to, to be syncing at the time, there's not that many of those. And if someone raises the alarm, as soon as one person notices is they can raise the alarm and say, hey, this is, this is broken and my attack is, is kind of ruined. I'm much better off, if I can hack into Infura, I'm much better off looking at you know, the transaction flow that's going through them and things like that, um, where I can make a lot of money much more quietly, much better return on my investment than, than this. So it's worth being secure. It is worth taking the time to verify but it's also worth not panicking too much about it. Um, and so just some basic sanity checks is, is probably all that's gonna be needed. The final thing that, that is a bit of a bugbear of mine and it's, it's a problem even in Teku is that the default is still syncing from Genesis. And that's a bad way to sync the beacon chain. You shouldn't do it. How we get around that in, in a usability sense without just embedding a source of the initial state is a bit of a problem. Um, so we haven't really solved that and that's why the, benefit, the default is still syncing with Genesis. But hopefully over time, we can build up better ways of finding these states or make it easier for users to pick from multiple selections or things like that so that clients can essentially just refuse to sync from Genesis because it's not a great idea. Um, so what have we covered? Let's, let's kind of revisit all. Checkpoint sync is really fast. It's by far the easiest and fastest way to sync the beacon chain. And even post-merge, when you have to wait for the execution layer to download uh, the world state, which, which will be slow still and take hours, having your beacon chain in sync fast and immediately can provide much better information to the execution client about what the current chain head is, and that will speed up its downloading of the world state and making sure it's downloading the right one straight away. 
Checkpoint Sync isn't just faster, it's more secure. It's the way you should be syncing the beacon chain. Um, but it's not entirely trust-free and there are still some problems, particularly around needing more support from infrastructure providers to make these states available. Um, it's, it's been a chicken and egg problem in having clients support it at all and then getting at least Infura to, to provide it. Now all the clients support it. Now we need some more infrastructure providers. So there are more sources. So we're not just dependent on Infura as awesome as they are. And that is Checkpoint Sync in a relatively large nutshell. Um, has anyone got questions? I've got some time. So while everyone's rushing to the front with their question, or no questions, not just one, but multiple, let me try and think through this. So I, so I download Teku and, um, you know, so the, um, so, and I, which I assume comes as a Docker container or something like that. And I what, change the config to say, no, I want to um, use checkpoints. So do I point it at a, is, would it just automatically out of the box point at say Infura and grab that 50 meg file or how, how would it work? So we've deliberately not embedded things. If I can get all the way back to this demo, um, deliberately not specified a particular provider. So mm -hmm. we provide an, an initial state option. So in here that will take any file or a URL. And mm -hmm. all it's got to do is that URL has to give back the state. So in this case, I'm using it for Europe, but you've got to provide that full URL. It can be from one of your other nodes and so on. The reason we don't just mm -hmm. default to Infura is that yeah, for Teku, it's not so bad because we're, we're from consensus, Infura is from consensus. It's like we're providing a node and we'll provide you with a trusted state. You're still mostly trusting us. But it feels really awful as a client developer to pick and choose the winners in the trust stakes. That's not our role. And we really want to stay well away from from telling you who you should trust. Um, our job is to actually minimize trust. So we, we've deliberately made it so that you have to tell us where to get the state from. Um, and that that hopefully over time will mean that we do get more variety and it doesn't just lock into one source that everyone goes to. Mm, yeah, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, though I can imagine then that that link there is then available on the internet so then you go to a web page i mean because i remember with um, metamask i wanted to use polygon or um you know a relatively major but non-ethereum mainnet chain and i ended up having to go onto a website and go all right i'm going to copy the you know this url paste it into metamask and hope that i don't sort of um lose all my money and so i mean this is not quite the same thing because at least you're going to be able to verify you know, once you've got the state, you can then verify that it's correct. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that, that is kind of the, the, the fun part of this is that somewhere in this, you have to have an initial state you trust. You've got to pick who you're trusting. Um, so Infura is pretty good because you can get this URL from their dashboard um, and, and you can go to Infura, log into your account, and it will tell you this is the URL to use to access their API. Um, and getting the state is just a standard part, part of the the beacon node rest api um but yeah it is something that it's probably not a very common attack vector but it's a potential one where people will put up fake states and say you download this and then they'll put you onto their chain it's relatively Presum easy to notice <laughs> presumably every uh well not presumably every every um every uh, valid client in the on the same main chain will have the same finalized state, right? Uh, if they're in sync, yeah. So, or they'll have a finalized state somewhere earlier back in the chain, yes. Oh, yes, yeah, at a certain yeah. point in history, they'll have a finalized state. Um, uh, rather than just um, one uh, URL, um, would it make sense to go and check two or three or four? And if they're all the same, and they're from people that you, you know, one or two or three, one or two or three, um, uh, you know, block explorers and Infura and and someone else, um, uh, you know, um, 
and and the more the merrier. Yep. So then you'd have to go and get, you know, someone to have to attach and say, oh, check these 10 people and all 10 of them are really trustworthy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's, that's where we want to get to. If you can get the state from multiple places and verify the state, which is even smaller. So what you'd do is you'd pick one of the, the providers to download the full 50 meg state from. All the others, you'd just say, it's at this slot, do you have this state route? And I'll say yes or no. Or, you know, give me the state route at this slot, basically. And they'll just give you 32 bytes back. And you've, you've fully verified the state matches what they view of the world. That's absolutely where we want to get to. Um, the challenge is just having people providing an API to do that and, and a source. Currently, it's manual because you've got to go to you know, Beacon Chain, their website, and manually get it because it's a different thing. It's not programmatic. But um, I think over yeah, time, that kind of thing will become more common. How do you put that in a, um, a simple config one line to say, I want these three or four or five people? Um, Absolutely, yeah. I yeah, I, it's kind of annoying to have to supply five different URLs. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah even two you... gives you a high, a very, very high level of security, really. Yeah, I guess you could make that a hardcore configuration option for uh, people who really care about it. And then the, because uh, obviously, there obviously is a very high degree of trust in, um, in, in, in client developers because they're writing the code as well, right? So, you, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's peer review, it's, it's open source. Well, most blockchains are open source, so, so, some aren't. Um, but but the ones that are open source and have multiple different languages and teams building clients have a high degree of trust because they've all got to interoperate with each other and, and, and so on. Um, so yeah, if you gave a, rather than this long thing, if you had, you know, some short names and pick five of them or all, and you could not quite easily explain which, which URLs you're using, then I think that you could probably make it, um, uh, relatively, because because I think what, what you don't want to hard code. I mean, obviously, if you're and and, and tech user, but you don't, if you don't necessarily want to hard code, if 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 you do, if you're not running a a, 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 a site, right? So some of the other clients might not be running a site. They don't necessarily want to hard code one person in case that one person gets compromised. Or even you don't necessarily want to encode if you in case if gets compromised. So if you hard coded ten or five or whatever then you could just have the default as check these five and yep. that yeah. way you're protecting against one of them being compromised. Yeah, I think I think that's probably the trade-off we'll have to wind up getting to. Um, problem at the moment is there aren't five, there's one. So we're kind of <laughs> really hamstrung. Um, there is a real... Just downloaded Sorry. the the SSZ of the state or you're talking about beginning the whole just for verification? Um, either we just don't have a standard API that people provide so and, and most of them require credentials so even this Infura, like I've yeah. hidden it because I wanted to embed yeah, this yeah. in a video um, it's it's a unique URL for me not one that I can put into Teku um, mm. so there's there's problems like that where we really want to make some of these APIs just freely available to everyone um, rather than requiring specific credentials and then then I think if you've got a few of those, um, then I think we might get over the hump of client developers being worried about trying to endorse specific providers um, because that that does worry us a lot. Um, there's already too much trust in, in client developers in many ways um, and too much power. We don't want to also be using that power to pick the winners of you know, source, source of state. And if you only pick one and then that one gets compromised, then... Yeah, like, yeah. You look so bad, it's not your fault, right? <laughs> yeah, there's absolutely no way we'd embed one. But once you get to you know four or five, maybe that's enough to be able to say we won't even default to them, but we'll give you an easy alias for them. Yeah, and then yeah, you yeah. pick which ones you trust out of there. That might and be you can add your own extras and things like that. And yeah, yeah. So that's the kind of trade off we need to find. But we before we can get to there, we need to have some options, um, and it's just swinging back around to putting some pressure on infrastructure providers um, and, and kind of saying, nah, step up, 
um, don't just provide a block explorer with a website. Give us give us this URL so we can at least verify the state, or you know, ideally that we can get the state from. And we'll get there over time. I'm sure other people, if other people want to ask questions, jump in. Yeah, I, I've. Oh, just to, yeah, other people go because I've. I've oh, got I'm on the old chat forever, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to stop sharing question. my screen so I can see you in front of me instead of. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've got another question, but I, I think Paul Paul's got a question. You got a question, Paul? Go. I was just thinking maybe it'd be worth providing. We've got initial state, but maybe initial state root as well, and then on the command line you can say this is the root I'm expecting, and you could have validated that everywhere so that when we download that ssz payload which obviously is hard to verify we could check the root and go yes it matches what you're what you've researched and given me yeah that kind of yeah. validation yeah and we can do things like it's easier to find the block root than it is the state root so we could make make it pop, like and we can check you can you can take the state and calculate the block root that it must have come from from that state but it's slightly, you, you don't do it by hand. Um, you can do it by code. So we could build that in as well. So it's much easier to, to say, here's the block root at this block at this slot and here's the state from it. And take will be able to match them up still. Um, when I say infrastructure yeah. providers, who am I referring? Um, well, that was direct to me. Oh, well, I've said it now. I'll answer to everyone. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so Infura is obviously a big one, uh, but you know, there's all the, and if you're like services like Alchemy, um, would be great to see them do it. For me, the big ones are blockchain explorers um, because they tend to be a really trusted point of what's the state of the network. Anyway, people people go there to see you know the latest block and what transactions are in it and, and kind of explore the chain. Um, that's an element of trust. So if you're putting that trust in them anyway, then it's really nice to be able to just use that same same service to uh enhance the trust and verify what your local node is thinking and, and exchanges i presume as well as another big one that would have a vested interest in in making that publicly available even though they you know, yeah absolutely i mean i mean it can be anyone where there's a point of trust in the network um so it it, it could be a random person that that is just well known like an individual that's fine it's fairly unlikely um, oh, there you go, Adrian. You could run a, a CDN. No, Pete, I was going to say, Pete, you. <laughs> you can have the Brisbane. Well, uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be fair, when when we first started, before Infura had had the API available, the standard way people would get these was they would ask on Discord, "Hey, how do I get it?" And I would put it in a GitHub repository and point them to the URL. So literally, I have done this by hand, and you know, it worked. It's not the best point of trust to get a state from someone on Discord. That is probably more likely so, to kill you than not. But. So I want to ask about what's probably a bigger issue then. Um, so in, I don't know, July or August, we all pop champagne corks and um, the mergers happened. And I um, do this um, checkpoint sync so that now my beacon chain is up to, up to date. And I've got the execution layer that I've just got installed and working there with it. How does it sync? Is can I download the state at that point from somewhere and then check with the beacon chain that I've now synced that it's the right uh, well, execution chain state? Well, that's that's essentially how the execution layer normally syncs. So you can do a full sync of the Ethereum proof work chain and you start from Genesis and apply every block. It takes months. Nobody does it unless you're using Aragon. Um, and you know, Aragon, it still takes weeks and people are starting to complain about it. And the worst part is it will keep taking longer and longer over time because there's more blocks. Um, so what uh, the proof of work clients or the execution clients will default to is either fast sync or snap sync. And what that is, is that they will download the block chain, like a, the, the chain of blocks from Genesis and they'll verify the proof of work to say, hey, that's right. And in that, is a, a state route. And then from that state route, they go out to all their peers and download the world state. And the difference between fast sync and snap sync is purely in how they request that state and how they build it from their peers. Um, so it is doing effectively the same thing, but because the state is so much bigger, you can't just serve it over HTTP well. Um, so so, so we'll, have... we'll still need to be doing all the, getting all those block headers the whole way through even 
post merge well, we won't so be able to just no merge. so it, in fact it kind of becomes useless so post merge uh, if you download all the block headers you still have no confidence that you, you you have absolutely no way of telling that it's a valid chain or the best chain or so on whereas with proof of work it's expensive to build that string of headers because you've got to do the proof of work um, once we do the merge you're going to get a whole bunch of headers that anyone could create for free um, they're trivial to create with any state route they want because they don't even need to do the transition they just make it up you're not going to check um, so your execution client is actually incapable of determining what the correct head is um, post merge that's what your beacon chain your, your consensus layer node is for and so the reason checkpoint sync works so well for this is that you you get your beacon node up and running and it then can continuously tells your execution layer um, what the current chain head is and that's how it follows it so when you're in sync that's how it imports a new block it gets it from the beacon from the beacon node um, and it's then told that's the new head we reorg it's told from the beacon node when you're starting fresh it does the same kind of thing instead of downloading the whole history of blocks it listens to the beacon node and is told this is the head um, and it gets you know, that block it starts downloading some history so that it's got it but primarily it just gets a state root out of what the beacon node told it was the head and it can then go and download the world state so the sooner your beacon node is in sync the sooner your execution client can effectively start syncing or at least start syncing the right state um so, yeah. so I think so, so all this has basically got to do with the problem of nothing at stake and that attack where all the exited validators can be up to a chain. Because then you've got two chains that are identical. Whereas yeah. in proof of work, which is what we're going to criticism is proof of work, while well, you can always go back and recreate a brand new chain that the thing is that the rule says look at the one with the highest amount of work in it. So even yeah. if you've done a fake one really quickly, it won't have as much work height as the as the real one. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, because you're trusting the, even in the best case, you're trusting the Genesis block that's built into the, well, I say it's not the best case. You can always go back to the what Peter said and recreate it all. But once you've switched over to, to, to proof of stake, you're still vulnerable to that attack anyway, right? Yep. Um, if a client embedded in it a two month old state, you're not then reliant on any one provider. Like if, if a provider gets taken out, you, if you yep. get compromised, you haven't, you're not downloading at that point. And yes, I know you're saying you don't want to do that, but if you're taking one that's two months old, or is it this thing that will age too rapidly? Yeah, so I think that's the challenge. I, I mean, it doesn't really matter how old it is when we select it, it's finalized, it's finalized. We do that about you know, 12 to 20 minutes, um, basically, is from the chain head. Um, I, I think the, the real risk there is that you're then dependent on us putting out a new release often enough that we stay within that week's subjectivity period. Um, and it, it kind of becomes it becomes a real pressure point for developers and challenging to make sure we consistently get the right one into our builds yeah. the way that we test and so on. So that weak subjectivity point, however, that, that's only a theoretical point, right? So in, in order to, 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 for that, not only do you have to have passed that time period, but two thirds of the validators yeah. have to have exited in order to make the attack from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So at, <laughs> at the moment, already get, I, if you only get 10% exiting per month, you're going to have to wait six months before you could yeah, make the attack the, anyway. The catch, though, is that you don't... You, you don't know how many... the future you've got to predict. So yeah. we know the maximum rate that they might change over, and that's what the week's subjectivity period is calculated off um, to give you some level of confidence. Uh, but... We, but you would know in advance that an attack is going to happen because you would know that two thirds have exited. So in other words- No, well, so not necessarily. So if we're, if we're updating regularly, then yes. But if I'm, if I say- oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, someone, if someone's months, monitoring it, if my, someone's monitoring, they can calculate not just the subjective period, but they can put yeah. an actual 
they could publish an yeah, actual. So at, and if it ever got too short, you would know when to. <laughs> yeah, at the point we cut our release, we kind of got to guess how long it'll be in the future. So we look at the worst case. Um, and that's why there are there are entry and exit queues on the beacon train. It's deliberately yeah. to make sure that you but can't if turn the, them over. The day after you release, suddenly two thirds exited, yes. you would say, oh, we've got two months before we're yeah. vulnerable to an attack. Yeah, absolutely. We could we could see that. Um, again, it kind of mostly comes attack. down to yeah. <laughs> it mostly comes down to client developers not wanting that responsibility for being the arbiter <laughs> of the finalized chain. That that feels like too much power for us. Fair enough. Um, I think Hayden had a question. I don't think Paul's answered yeah. it. Not sure. Yeah. So uh, in terms of fetching yeah in terms of standardizing things so there is the standard rest api um, that each node uh, all clients support for the beacon node and that has all the information we need to do checkpoint sync off of um, there's some variance on both sides here so well so first thing is only in fewer currently provide that whole rest api it's not really designed to be exposed to the whole world like that um, there's lots of fairly expensive things you can make a node do for it. And Infura have, have got the experience of monitoring people and kicking you off their platform if you're being a jerk. Um, but you know, it's not something you would just stand up exposed to the world and expect it to live long. Um, so there is a much simpler set of things. So for example, for Teku, all we need is literally the finalized state. Um, so any URL, you can put it on a web server, you can put it in GitHub, that kind of thing, and point to it, and that works. Some of the other clients want the block in the state. Some of them want um, slightly more specific things where they've got to find it where it wasn't a, an empty slot on the epoch boundary. So Lighthouse has to kind of search back a bit. So Lighthouse tends to need the full REST API, which isn't very good. Others need block and state together, whereas tech, you can deal with just having the state. Um, as we see clients become much more like state, it become better and, and only needing the state, it becomes easier to standardize how to get that. But I think the primary thing which no one's really fleshed out is just this a really simple API. And, and it's not a design challenge. It's literally just we've got to have people who want to implement it. We'll just say it's this um, of saying, you know, I need the, the state route or the block route for this slot. Um, which will be a really simple API, but we just need it to be nice and standard and not behind credentials. Um, so that then we, we've got our state from one place, we can use a standard API to, to verify it against a whole bunch of different providers. Um, you know, we could write that spec down today just to standardize it off the top of your head. You can just see it's, you know, any URL with got a slot in it and it returns a, a byte 32 root, um, really simple stuff. Um, we can bike shed, you know, what the URL is for as long as you like, but it's going to be straightforward. It is just a matter of people need to be willing to actually provide that and not have it require signing up for an account, which currently all the APIs do. Um, so, so somewhere in there, we just need to really herd the cats, I think is, is basically what it's going to come down to is get, you know, Beacon Chain Explorers and, and if you're an alchemy and whoever else in a room and say, right, this is what we need from you. Can you get it done? And really just put the pressure on. And I, I think it'll happen relatively straightforward. Um, it's just got to apply that pressure. Um, in terms of running your own nodes, yeah, absolutely. If you've already got a synced node, that standard REST API gives you everything you need for any client to sync off of that. So once you've got one node, you should use it as your source for checkpoint sync all the time. And then everything is trustless. You're only trusting yourself. Okay, so I think we might have run out of questions. Yeah. Given everyone 30 <laughs> seconds. So. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much, Adrian, for your talk. Um, yeah, that was um, very much appreciated. And um, I've learned, I know I've learned an awful lot about how that actually works because, um, yeah, open a question how do we actually sync in this new era? So thank you. I'm going to quickly share my slides now and hopefully be able to share the correct slide deck. Yep, that's the one. Okay, and um, 
So um, socials for the uh, meetup group. So um, the, this recording of this will be on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, there's it's a meetup group. You can join, anyone can attend. Um, that we, there's a Slack workspace. Um, and so some people have discussions on there from time to time. On that Slack workspace, there's a formal methods reading group as well, who meet every two weeks. And um, you can go to their channel within the Slack workspace to find out more, propose papers and find out what they're reading about this week. Coming up, um, we've got just next week, in fact, next Wednesday, we've got a talk by Wei Zhe Zhang. And so he's going to be talking about cross-chain asset transfer for NFT. So he's been looking at these NFTs and trying, and he's come up with actual classifications of different types of NFTs and hence the different properties they have and hence what makes sense and doesn't make sense from a cross-chain perspective. <laughs> so as far as, you know, does it make sense for a certain sort of credential to be on multiple chains? And if so, what does it mean? Um, then for two weeks, we're going to have a winter break, um, which is great. And then, or if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, a summer break. Um, then um, Vanessa from uh, Consensus R&D is going to talk about MEV and Ethereum 2. So essentially, with the beacon chain, um, is MEV possible? What does it look like? How do you do it? And um, what does it all mean? Um, Ermius, a week after that, is going to talk about atomicity and cross-chain transactions. And so he's done some thinking about what that actually means. And um, from there on, all the talks are a, a bit up in the air. And there's a potential talk on Gnosis that we're looking at. Um, there's also one on security, um, solidity security. There's a talk on Infura and, and Truffle. And I'm just trying to get those people to... Um, sort of essentially sign up for the talk and confirm the dates. So they've sort of signed up tentatively to say, yes, I'm interested in doing it. And then I think, um, as we all know, putting these talks together takes a lot of work. So thank you again, Adrian. Um, but yeah, so putting the talks takes a long time. And so I guess they're going, all right, yes, we want to do it. We've just got to find time to actually write those slides and get everything ready. So um, hopefully we'll see everyone next week and have a great week and talk to you all later. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.